Welcome everyone. We're going to take a look at tonal rendering using a pair and talking about the light and dark chiaroscuro form that we might find. Things that we're going to look at. Highlight, that's the reflection of the light source on your surface. The half tone is the transitional tones and values between light and dark. The terminator is the line that represents the border between light and dark. Our core shadow is the darkest dark in the shadow on the form. The reflected light is going to be bouncing off of a surface or nearby object and filling in the shadow a bit. The occlusion shadow comes from the idea of occlude or to block. It's the deepest shadow. Cast shadow is cast onto the surface beneath it. And the penumbra is the softer edge to the shadow. Now we're going to get started here using graphite. I've got my grayscale laid out. And I'm going to loosely, very loosely, rough in a shape for the pair. It starts with a somewhat circular base and kind of a rounded off cone on top of it. I've got a little bit of a horizon line or really just the table edge in the background. And I'm going back through with a, it's an HB pencil, so it's not going to damage the surface of the paper. It's not going to be too dark. It's not going to be too light necessarily with a light touch. And I'm using some straighter lines just to clean the shape up a little bit. Those straighter lines because they represent something that is going to be uh, a closer average. Uh, meaning you're able to get to the more specific shape easier and quicker. If you look at the curve and try to copy that curve down exactly, you're almost never going to get it. But you can go from point A to point B and create more of a straight line and be pretty accurate in terms of an average representation of that edge. Once you've gotten close to it, like a sculptor, pushing the, the marble around it and cutting off big chunks and slices, then you start shaping it and getting a little bit more clear and specific. Once I've got that outside designed, I'm representing the cast shadow on the ground and I've taken a kind of zigzag line down the middle of the pair to separate light and shadow. I held my pencil up there for a moment so that it was able to catch an angle so that I knew how far to take the stem out so that the stem didn't lean out further than it needed to be. Now I'm going to be ready to start uh, laying down the actual tone. So I've held up my grayscale to figure out what color I needed to make this shadow. And I decided it's relatively pretty dark, as you can tell from the picture. So I'm going to use a 6B very lightly. This is being applied with little loops, even though the speed up version here is it's hard to fully see the, the movement of the pencil. Little loops laying down the stroke uh, with a very flat edge of the pencil against the paper rather than the point. And I'm literally going to be looking at this in terms of a few values. So remembering what we were doing with the no tan drawings, trying to represent things this way as an initial step is a great way to make sure that your light source and shadow have clear boundaries and clear divisions. So we're going to watch a couple layers being built up here in the in the darkest uh, cast shadow regions. Multiple directions, though pretty similar in angle right now. So they're very subtle adjustments. Uh, and then as they get darker, we'll come in here at a very crossing direction. Now nothing yet is set in stone, and it can be easily moved or erased if necessary. And that is really one of the big virtues of laying the pencil in uh, very flat against the surface, not digging it down into the paper fibers yet where it's unable to be removed if necessary. And I'm going to bring that same 6B up into the shadow form on the pair. And it'll start to look like three big puzzle pieces essentially. A light side, a shadow on the form, and then the cast shadow on the ground. And I'm taking these strokes, generally speaking, with the form. I'm not going 
diagonally at the same angle as the stem is, I'm going down the side of that cone on top of the pear and continuing that same direction uh, into the, the lower half and then crossing that a little bit and, and varying the direction a little bit as I get to the right side so that it feels like it fans across that form. That way if any of these lines are still visible at the end, they're not hurting the form, like collapsing it in. They're building that form outward as much as possible. So you can already see this no tan kind of approach. We got a white, a light gray, and a darker gray. And you achieve a pretty good illusion already of, of a pair. I'm starting to noodle in around near the occlusion shadow, the deepest dark, where the light is not able to bounce into and illuminate at all. Uh, you can see in the cast shadow there's a little luminosity. It's receiving some light off of the pair itself. So you've, if you look into that shadow, you can even kind of see that green cast to it. And I'm slowly building this up. This is three layers already with that deeper dark near the recessed occluded shadow and softening out towards the edges a bit. My marks get a little bit more specific. Nowhere near dark enough yet, but we're getting closer and you want to be mindful of any areas where it seems to build up a little bit more. It gets a little darker than it needs to. So I'm trying to avoid some of that, being very specific about where I put those marks. And again, continuing to shape near the actual form. Uh, the pear itself doesn't have a sharp, you know, collaged edge to the base, meaning it doesn't look like I've taken a pair of scissors and cut it out and planted it right on that cast shadow. It's soft. As that form turns down into the occlusion shadow on the ground, you lose more and more as it goes. It gets darker. It rolls away from that light. So it does feel softer on that edge. Now we're coming back into the form of the pair. I'm laying in still with the 6B, still very flat, and pushing the darks a little bit further. So we're going to hit some of the core shadows and darker darks and build this thing up in multiple places, not just finish the cast shadow and call it done. I want to see this thing slowly come up through multiple layers. So pulling that core shadow across the spherical shape there. You can see that curvature helping to define the sphere. And this idea of using no tan to push the light and dark into separate areas is really useful because the reflected light is oftentimes something we can oversee on the form and it's immediately pushed gray. It's immediately pushed back. The reflected light is the brightest part in the shadow, but it's darker than anything in the light. Looking at the background, and I'll do some interpretation. Uh, you don't necessarily have to represent exactly uh, what's going on necessarily. I, I think I end up leaving the background a little bit brighter. Didn't need to be any darker than it really was. Uh, I had that value relationship of a dark and a light against a midtone, and that's what I needed. If it got any heavier in the background, I felt like it was going to start to compete uh, with the primary figure right now. might work in the photo, but it didn't seem to be uh, important in the drawing at this point. But it is more of a study, and the ground is less important right now than the primary figure, so I wanted to be supportive of that light, supportive of that shadow on the figure. Now here I'm using a B pencil. Uh, this is something I would use my grayscale again to figure out what color I wanted in that background. It's definitely uh, a couple steps brighter than that cast shadow on the ground, so I moved uh, quite a few steps forward on the grayscale uh, to something just a little bit softer than an HB pencil. 
I wanted it also to be smoother. So if the pressure of that B needed to be a little bit heavier so that it pushed in a little bit darker, then that was going to enable it to be smoother at the end of the day as well. And I say I want it smoother in the background because texture comes forward. Texture on that pair is far more important than a background texture. So if the eye starts to gravitate towards the background, then I'm losing emphasis on my primary figure. Going back in with that 6B on the stem and some of the darker darks again on the form. First layers in some cases. Second and third layers starting to happen on the pair right now. And the, the directional change, it's not like cross-hatching so much as weaving these lines together. Uh, they're they're not crossing at very oblique angles. They're they're similar, something subtle even. And here I've switched to a clutch pencil. It's essentially the same pencil weights and leads that you'll end up using, uh, but it comes in a barrel that uh, never changes size when you sharpen it, right? So that's the benefit of a pencil like this. Uh, and this is a 4B lead. It was freshly sharpened, so I started with the edge to kind of contain that form as best I could right now and it's smoothing out some of the texture of that 6B. So one step harder and a sharper lead will help you smooth that graphite down into the cracks of the paper just a little bit more. And I'll use a kneaded eraser occasionally if something's gone a little dark. I want to reshape what I'm seeing on the shadow again pushing that core shadow and not afraid to let it continue to push that reflected light darker. Uh, the virtue of laying some strokes in from different directions also helps to connect something that can sometimes on a drawing look like a band that disconnects from the form. Uh, it feels different from something underneath it. So when you're doing a core shadow, it's useful to also take some of those strokes uh, down in and across uh, to kind of mesh them together with what's already existing in the reflected light or surrounding tones. We're back to the 6B. And this is going to really help push that value up into the form, softening that edge. It's essentially the reflection of the paper surface up underneath that core shadow. As that falls down under and starts to touch the surface of the paper, the shadow on the ground, the cast shadow blocks the light reflecting up that surface. So that's why we continually need to soften that edge as it's rolling under. And I'm looking now at the kind of division and, and shape that starts to happen around on the base of the pair. Not wanting to cut anything out too sharply, so immediately softening things after I have to clean up an edge uh, to perfect the shape. Using the 4B pencil again, pushes things darker, smooths the texture. By being in control of the smoothness of your texture, when you want to introduce a visible texture of the surface of the pair, then you're in control of it. You're not beholden to whatever the paper gives you. You can go in and add more texture. Uh, sometimes you can use the texture of the paper and draw around it. Uh, but that'll be something I get to later uh, in, in about 10 minutes probably in the video where that texture becomes something that I'm really thinking about right now. Simple form, light to shadow, gradients, and bringing a resolution to that, that volume. When I do get a pencil going, uh, I'll start bouncing it around. So you saw that 4B used a lot already. I'm shifting to the 2B now. Slowly getting a little bit harder. Uh, this again will start on edges and on areas where I want uh, the darkness and the sharpness of the pencil to be built up a little bit more. Not coming in with a rounded, blunted point on the pencil that's not able to get down into that texture. You really want that mark that you're making to be consistent, something that you can rely upon. And Maintaining that sharpness allows that, again, specificity that you can make each mark do what it needs to do. OK, 
Occasionally you'll get some buildup as you start sharpening the pencil and digging back into areas where you've laid down soft pencil weights. So a lot of 6B on there. My sharp point there was starting to pick up a little bit of the graphite and you might get little flecks. Just remember not to blow down at your drawing so that you accidentally spit on it. Keep uh, tipping your paper up uh, and tapping it off if you need to. Moving back to a B pencil, I was using that in a wood pencil before, but I've got uh, a nice, sharp, fresh one ready to go right here in the mechanical pencil. So that B uh, was laid in at a different direction than the original one. Uh, it was more vertical the first time I laid it in diagonally, and I made sure to bring that continuity to the other side of the pair. So oftentimes in initial drawings, you'll see students kind of let the background echo away from the form. I like to make sure that the background feels like it continuously goes behind it and doesn't necessarily attach to the form. So if I make a mark going a direction on the left or the right side, I want to make sure it transitions to the opposite side. And you'll see more of that as we go. Still using the B pencil and bringing a little transitional stage from that core shadow into the half tones. So we're starting to blend and look at the soft edge variation that happens along that terminator line between the light and shadow, that boundary. A little bit of finesse out of it. It's sort of a mark that begins in the core shadow and builds out of it, kind of a feathered edge. So it's soft and lightened as it goes into the light source. It's so easy to go too dark too quick, so I'm very sensitive to that process of subtle transition. I can absolutely always darken it if I need to. It's much harder to lighten it without you know, a lot of work with the eraser. And blending these from a couple different angles again down there. I'm sort of investigating what kind of shape I want that vignette in the background to look like. It's not going to be a full bleed image where it's squared off like the picture in the background. I want it to feel softer back there and so that the sharpness is on the pair itself. So that shape is kind of designed to balance what's going on. There's a lot of weight with the cast shadow on the ground. It moves to the left. The stem moves off to the left as well. So it kind of trails out and I allow that stem to break out of that uh, gray background just a little bit. Now I'm back to using the 2B. And there's not necessarily a rule that says you can't bring the softer pencil weight back in, even if you've done some work with a B over top of it already. 2B is not that far. Where you end up running into trouble is if you do a 6B passage like the cast shadow, and I came back in with a 2H pencil, that's more liable to scratch the paper, scratch the pencil actually off the surface a little bit. But when you need something to go a little darker, you can't always do it with the harder pencil weight without pushing harder than you really want to, uh, which might damage the paper. But just a little bit more continuation of specific shape. So that big broad no tan idea, we're working much more in subtle moments now, little moments. And finding the jigsaw puzzle within some of those initial shapes. So within that no tan shadow side, there are two or three values at least. It's much easier to find those when it's been subdivided. So bigger to smaller, always. And building those transition moments now.
I'm coming in here now with an H pencil. And I accidentally hit the surface in the background, so I needed to clean that up. But the H pencil is going to be a nice transition from those half tones more to the light tones. And it's very subtle. I don't want to really to pick it up on camera even a little bit at this point. It's so easy to accidentally make a line that's heavier and more specific than you want at this point. So it's very lightly applied with just the weight of the pencil as much as I can. And, you know, I'm looking at, just like I did on the shadow side, subdividing the light half into a couple tones. There's the brightest brights, and there's some transitions uh, down towards the core shadow and half tones. Taking it into the background, I, I like to blend foreground and background a little bit with the pencil weights, just to allow for some of that texture to be similar right now. I want that H pencil to smooth out the texture just a little bit more, and I'll be bringing that physical texture of the pair into play as we get closer to the end. It's important to really think about where that highlight is, the reflection of your light. I want to save that paper white. I try not to erase things too much. Uh, I like my marks to be done mostly with the pencil. If you do choose to use an eraser, just be mindful that it's going to create a different kind of mark than the application of pencil. So it may be a little softer. Uh, it may even blend or blur uh, the graphite that's already on the paper. So know that going in, and you might need to touch the edge back with the pencil. But in order for that highlight to really stand out, you absolutely need to reach a tonal difference between the paper itself and your half tones nearby. I'm using an HB pencil here, transitional, uh, right in the middle of your grayscale essentially. It's going to help me push the smoothness around a little bit. I felt like there wasn't as much texture visible in the top conical area of the, the pair, and I wanted to save that more for the belly and the rounded sphere near the bottom. But I am using it to come into the half tones now and help connect. Um, essentially, the H pencil was a little bit uh, too heavy with the linear uh, aspect. It, it laid down marks that were a little more uh, smooth. And I do have some texture still visible from the core shadow and in other areas in the shadow side. So bringing that HB into the light allows for a little of the surface texture to show up. Back into the shadow side with the B pencil. So if you've noticed, I've gone from soft to harder as I'm working. The B is a nice multi-purpose lead for me. Uh, you may find yourself gravitating towards a specific lead weight that you kind of always go to. I find it's able to maintain a pretty sharp point. I can put it on pretty light if I need to. I can go much darker than I can with an HB. Uh, so I find it really versatile. Here I'm laying down a little bit of a gradient to the background. It's very faint. But the idea that that light is coming from the right side, that direct light source, something we absolutely need in this composition to achieve a good sense of light and shadow on the form. One single light, not five lights, not an overhead fluorescent light and a little desk lamp and a, a backlit uh, thing from your computer. Make sure that this is as singular of a light as possible but allowing that to fall off across the ground will help create a little bit more atmosphere. I want that to happen in the background as well, just a little bit darker on the left, and so I'll get to that soon. Uh, and that was all laid on the ground uh, with a very, very hard pencil, 2H. And we're bringing the hard lead weight back into the side of the light so that it's starting to turn a little bit darker near the bottom, getting a little bit more uh, specific shape detail uh, because of some of those overlapping shapes that seem to happen down there. 
curved shapes, stacked on curved shapes a little bit, uh, with a little bit of a highlight on top of each. Uh, that highlight on the bottom one, near the core shadow, though, is not anywhere close to as bright as what's happening at the top. So I was trying to tone that back a little bit, and it's, it's very subtle right now. I am bringing the 2B back in just to push the dark a little bit more. As you introduce more value into the light half, it's not uncommon that you need to come back in and deepen the dark just a little bit more to make sure that you maintain that no tan kind of read on the whole picture. Drawing is making references from point A to point B and from top to bottom and left to right. So whatever you're drawing, in terms of a detail, you're referencing where it exists relative to something else. It's important that we don't start with these little details because they will never be in the right spot. You need that map to have the continent, to the country, to the state, to the city before you get to that specific landmark in any particular spot. So these details happen later. So don't get seduced by that really cool element and thing that you wanted to draw. Get the whole picture working. Bring the details up near the end. And as you lay these details in, be sure that they're not too sharp. They don't uh, want to feel carved into the picture. They want to exist on that same surface. So be mindful of how heavy your hand is. If it scratches the surface and everything around it is kind of fuzzy and diffused, then it will be something of a, an eyesore on that surface. It'll feel like it's not unified with that surface. So here I am pushing that background back a little bit darker so it feels like that light is coming from the right side. And bouncing back and forth around the picture, final touches more or less. Bringing the cast shadow a little bit darker, refining that edge. I'm being mindful of how that bleeds up into the form and I don't accidentally cut it out uh, too sharply. That was with a B pencil back to the 2B. A little more darks, starting to get some textures. Making little shapes. Uh, in some cases, circling uh, even textural shapes that exist actually in the initial applications. So there might be a nice little dot shape uh, that happened in there, and I'll kind of circle around it because the pair itself has these kind of dots that feel dark with a light center. And it's easy to overdo it. I find that the texture is going to be mo most dominant uh, between that light and shadow. So you can think about the moon. You see the texture in that transition from light to dark. You don't necessarily see as much in the light side, and you definitely don't see any on the dark side. It gets thrown into complete black. So you want to be sensitive to where that texture is because it's going to draw the eye. And if it's near that form shadow, it's going to help pull the eye to that. Uh, and that form shadow will pull forward in space even a little bit because of that. Refining the stem a little bit. The stem has a little bit of a core shadow running down the middle of it. It's very subtle. It was only like one little stroke. Cleaning things up occasionally here. Refinement. I was looking at the overall uh, connection of the stem to the form and feeling like it needed a little bit more sharpness. So that'll get cleaned up. I'm sharpening the edge around the highlight. Bringing the background a little bit darker refining edges here so your edge of the overall form may be varied it's a little sharper up near the stem because it's actually got a cast shadow on it then it rolls down and gets a little firmer then you almost lose it as it comes across the paper white in the background and on the opposite side there's an edge near that table edge it feels very soft you almost lose it completely so look for those opportunities for the eye to travel along an edge and be responsive to what you see in front of you. Does it feel sharp? Does it feel soft? Could you lose that edge? The variety will keep us interested in a 
simple picture like this for a little bit longer than you might think. Really getting down to some final touches. Here I'm thinking about pushing that stem a little bit more to help balance what's happening at the bottom. Sharpening that edge on the bottom right. Softening that penumbra, uh, the soft edge around the cast shadow. I was using a very hard pencil, it was an H, so that feathered the soft pencil weight that was already existing there just a little bit and allowed you to move it out into the, the white tone just a little bit less textured. It's almost imperceptible changes that are happening now, just subtle things. Hopefully it's that kind of icing on the cake at the end. And I'm sorry I'm off picture here at the last minute, but oh, we're going to get a good look at it here. And that's where I've left it. So here we go for the final scan, cleaned up. Don't forget all of this information. We want this labeled on your final drawing. And I thank you all for watching. Look forward to seeing your work.